the the first thing that I have you do is just to give me your name first and last and the spelling so I have that on videotape. So if you could go ahead and do that. Yes, my name is Robert C. Finley, F-I-N-L-E-Y. Great. I live in Lacey. And you're up in room. You feel like oh, Okay. So let's start with here. Um, you're in the Army Air Force. And um, when did you join? Well, I, let's see, that would be 1943, graduated February of 44, graduated from cadets, that is, and I was in about a year in the cadet training program. Is that before flight school? or? Yes. Uh, I, I, went, I graduated from Vancouver, Washington High School uh, in 1941 and went to Pullman, to Washington State College. In those days it was called college. Mm -hmm. Now it's Washington State University. And I was there about a year and a half, and uh, of course, in the meantime, there was Pearl Harbor, <clears throat> and everybody was being called out for something. And I knew that I, I took uh, ROTC while I was there, and I knew I didn't want to be in the infantry. So I applied for aviation cadet training program, and fortunately, I was able to uh, pass the test. And uh, so then I was called up in February of 43. And sent down to Santa Ana, or sent down first of all to uh, um, Fresno, California, for basic army training. You know, KP and marching and that sort of thing. <clears throat> and then they uh, decided they would send us, rather than send us down to uh, Santa Ana, they would send us to a college training detachment. And we took an examination. We were put in either a two, three, four, five, or six month program. And I. Happened to be, because I had a college background, I was put in the two-month class and was sent back up here to Ellensburg to a college training detachment. I was there for two months. Then sent down to uh, Santa Ana, and they decided to make a, an experimental squadron of us. And so in, instead of having nine weeks of pre-flight, we, we had three weeks. So they slowed us down in one case, and they speeded us up in another. And uh, so I was in the three-week class. We took our pre-flight training there. And then I was sent to, uh, you want me to go on with? Oh, no, let's keep on dying. I'll, I'll, I'll interject when I'm All right, fine. And I was sent to my first base uh, for flying was over at uh, Tucson, Arizona, Ryan Field. And we flew the PT-22. PT uh, and I had about 60 hours of PT-22 training there. And we had ground school as well, which was uh, aircraft recognition, Navy recognition, and uh, old Morse code, <clears throat> a few things like that. Navigation, a little bit of navigation. When you were back at WSU, is that when Pearl Harbor was? Was it at that time? That's right. It was WSC at that time. WSC. Did you... Did you uh, do you remember that day? I remember that day very well. I played in a dance band and when I was played saxophone, clarinet. And Saturday night we played until one or two o'clock and or I didn't get to bed till two or three o'clock. So I was I slept in on Sunday morning. And about uh, ten thirty or so I came down the stairs and in the fraternity house I was a Lambda Chi Alpha fraternity and uh, all the fellows were lying around on the floor listening to the radio. And they said, uh, the Japs just bombed Pearl Harbor. I said, what or where is Pearl Harbor? <laughs> I, I didn't know where it was. <laughs> then I finally became educated in it. And uh, so we sat around and listened to the So you sort broadcast. of, was there some disbelief when they first said that or? Well, I, 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 yes, it just didn't have any, uh, I, I didn't know what to expect. I, it's hard I, to comprehend. Never, never been in that position before, you see. But shortly thereafter, of course, they had the draft and they had a lot of other things. And I'd go to class and the next day uh, some of our fellows would be gone and uh, in the fraternity house we would get greetings from the president, you know, that sort of thing. So I... Uh, so what was Pullman like at that time, at, right after the... Well, the Harvard did things change? fellows were, were getting called up and of course they they decided to increase the ROTC work uh, that we had. We had a 
we had an hour in the morning, I think seven to eight o'clock. <clears throat> used to be uh, half an hour, three days a week, and then, then it turned out to be an hour, five days a week. Mm -hmm. and mandatory. So, uh, so they have more and more military in that. Yeah, and I decided with that that I didn't want to be in the infantry, right. and I knew I'd be drafted, uh, so I decided I'd try for the aviation cadet training program. So when you finally uh, got in your flight training, when was it that um, another man I talked to that flew Marauders said at a certain point they asked him what type of aircraft he wanted to fly? Did, were you given that option? Uh, yes and no. All along the line, f from the very first, they, they wanted to know if we wanted, uh, uh, first of all, if we wanted uh, pilot training, navigation, or bombing. And if we wanted flight training, do we want, did we want uh, single engine or multi engine? And I always put single engine flying and I got it. But I know some of the fellows that put single engine and they got twin engine, or they, somebody wanted multi engine and, and they got single engine. Yeah, so this gentleman picked I think they, uh, they gave you a choice, but they put you where they want you. Yeah. This gentleman picked B 51s, he ended up with Marauders. Well, I didn't. I didn't have a choice on on uh, specific aircraft, mm -hmm. but I did ask for single engine uh, land aircraft, and uh, I did get it. How long did your uh, flight training take all from start to finish? Was it long or? Uh, I went in, and it, it took about a year uh. with with the college training detachment. But then, as I say, we speeded up in the. Uh, in the pre-flight, so uh, <clears throat> it took about a year. I, I graduated February eighth, nineteen forty-four, and then they sent uh, sent us down to uh, well, they gave us a leave, and then they sent us down to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And while I was there, I went through a, a physical, <clears throat> and they uh, claimed that I had a hernia, and I'd have to have an operation. So I had the operation, <clears throat> and then the uh, in those days, they kept you in bed a long time. I uh, I couldn't even raise my head off the pillow for a, a week, mm. and I had to stay in the hospital three weeks. Now you know they get you up right away. <clears throat> but uh, then they gave me a four-week leave, I think it was. So I decided I wanted to try to hitchhike by air from Louisiana back to Vancouver, Washington, my home. Did you make it? Yeah, well, partly, and I went down to the flight line, and I found that there was a a, a colonel <clears throat> that was going to fly a, a what we call an SB2C a plane north, and so I got a hold of him and asked him if he if I could get a ride, and he said, "You got a parachute?" I said, "I'll get one." So he said, "Well, meet me down at the flight line tomorrow morning." So I. <clears throat> Went down and scrounged a, a parachute from somebody. I don't know how I did it, but I did. And I met him down there at 8 o'clock. We got in this SP2C and went uh, north to uh, Leavenworth, Kansas. And uh, we went into a mess hall there about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And we had lunch. And uh, so he kind of lit a cigarette and kind of stretched and says, Well, he says, I think I'll take a shower and go to work. And I said, what do you do, Colonel? He says, I'm the CO. <laughs> so he was the CO of the Staff and Command School, which is all of your officers, before they can go up into the general rank, have to go through the Staff and Command School. And he was the CO. And I was, I was a little bright <laughs> gold bar second lieutenant riding with the, the Colonel of the Staff, the head of the Staff and Command School. Did you get another flight from there? To well, he uh, he sent me into town with some doctors. They had a they had a party that night in one of the hotels with some girls, and uh, I didn't uh, participate. But the next day, he said uh, you'd be best to go off out of uh, out of uh, Kansas City, uh, Kansas, I guess it was. So I went across the river and got in, and got to the airport, and there was a, a flight that was going out to uh, Colorado Springs. So I hitched a ride on that, <clears throat> got to Colorado Springs. They said, there's no flights going out of here. You might go up to Denver, maybe get a flight. So I took a bus up to Denver, 
and I got a flight that uh, of C-47 that was going to Great Falls, Montana, and from there up to Alaska, and from there over to Russia. So I got off at Great Falls, <clears throat> checked in there, and they said, there's nothing going west out of here, so I got a bus, came on down to Vancouver by bus. How long did that take you from start to finish? Oh, from start to finish? Yeah. About three days. That's not too bad. So you had, you had four weeks leave? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then I went back by train and went back through Los Angeles. When I was uh, taking flight, or uh, when I was a cadet, I met a girl at the uh, Hollywood Canteen and uh, got pretty well acquainted with her. And we danced and I fell in love with her and so I asked her to marry me and we, we were married uh, after, well that was a little later on, we were married up in Nebraska. So you spent part of your leave in LA then? Yeah. So did you see your mom and dad were up here in Vancouver still? And oh yeah, I came home. and. Did your mom up. know you are coming home or did you surprise her? Oh yeah, she didn't know when but uh, she... Uh, Happy to see you. Oh yeah. Yeah. Pretty worried about you, probably. Huh? Yeah. Uh, Especially later on when I was overseas, of course. My dad has been a mechanic; it's one of the jobs in his life, and so he was, he was asking me about mechanical things on the plane. And I, I was surprised how educated he was in, in aircraft and aircraft engines. But he must have read about it when he, when I was in the service. Uh, he must have uh, read up on it. Read up and was interested. Some contact with you. And, yeah. Uh, do you remember saying goodbye to your mom then? Was that the last time you saw her before you shipped overseas, or was there another time? I, I'm sorry, what was the question? Did, was, did, did you see your parents before you shipped overseas, or was that...? No, that would be the last time uh, before I was shipped over. Did they know that you, they might not see you again, or...? Well, they knew that I was... I was due to go? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. So was your mom pretty...? Oh yeah, she was... I think most moms are, you know. Mm -hmm. Do you remember her seeing, did she see you off the train or? Uh, I think my, uh, I think my dad took me over to Portland to get on the train rather than down at Vancouver. And I think my mother's, I think my mother stayed home. Uh, she didn't want the. She didn't want that last minute. Yeah, yeah. So you remember that one? So I got on the train home. and went down to LA and saw my girlfriend and then went back to Baton Rouge <clears throat> and uh, then went through some more testing, and then they finally sent us up to Bruning, Nebraska to start learning to fly P-47s. And uh, while we were there, uh, they had us lined up alphabetically, and they said, count off by 10. So we counted, and he said, this 10 will be with one instructor, and this 10 will be with another. <clears throat> so I, I didn't know any of these fellows that I were with, but uh, we became uh, very, very well acquainted and very close. And... Uh, after our period of, uh, of well, uh, during our uh, course of uh, training there with the P-47, we had about 100 and, I think we had 120 hours of P-47 training <clears throat> there at Bruning. Uh, one of the, we were sent up to uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota for gunnery, and one of the fellows was on a gunnery mission one day, a ground gunnery mission, and he failed to pull up and he flew into the target and was killed. So that left nine of us together. Had you known him a long time by then? Or? No, we just just had met. <clears throat> and, uh, but we became uh, very close friends, the nine of us, and on the train going back down to, we had to go back down to Baton Rouge, and we would sit up in the train and we'd sing, and we smoked, and we'd tell jokes, and we got very well acquainted. We, we really bonded, and uh, so uh, we called ourselves the Blue Flames because we were such hot, hot pilots, you see. So did the uh, so you went out in town together? Oh and, yeah. So is it you, for you? It's probably the first time you've seen a lot of the country, I suppose. Yeah. Oh yeah. For most of us. What was Baton Rouge like for all nine of you? Well, <clears throat> um, it was loaded with soldiers, and it wasn't much of a wasn't a very good town. Not a very good uh, town to go out on leave. No. Uh, went down to to uh, 
New Orleans, however, that was only. Well, you must have liked that if you're. Uh, yeah, we went down to New Orleans a few times. That was that was kind of nice. Being a saxophone player, you must have liked. Oh yeah. The jazz in New Orleans. Yeah, I got the chance to see some of that. Did you ever uh, play down there when you're? No, no, I. I played uh, on the boat going overseas. They they got a little pickup band together and we put on a show, for all the GIs, that, you know, just to kill time. We'd put on three shows a day, I think, for. The ten days that we were on board the ship. Did you take your own saxophone? With no, you? no, they had they had uh, horns on huh. on the ship. And we had one fellow who was a master of ceremonies, and he told jokes, and, mm. and we just faked the music. We uh, some somebody would dance, and so we'd we'd fake tea for two or something mm. like that, and uh, we put on. The, as I say, there were quite a few uh, quite a few people on that ship, and probably we couldn't each. Um, Probably only had room for maybe a hundred, so it took quite a few. Uh, we played uh, two or three, two or three gigs a day. So is that it, that was the Atlantic you were crossing then? Was yeah. Mm -hmm. Was it uh, weather good or bad or? Weather was reasonably good. Yeah. Have you ever been out in ships before in the ocean? No, not at all. What do you think about that? Well, um, it was it was okay. We were on a we were on a. Uh, French ship called the Columbia, like Columbia only mm -hmm. without the A on it. And uh, we had, uh, I don't know about the GIs, but the officers, we had excellent French cooking uh, with all with white tablecloth and all the silverware and the whole schmear. I think we only had two meals a day, however. Do you have your own cabin? and With sharing with, with others. With officers. Yeah, sure. Yeah, this B-26 pilot, he was on the English ship going across there and he ate it. Said for breakfast they had a cold piece of fish with cold white sauce on it. I uh, I have no complaints about the food on the Columbia. In fact, we came back on the uh, SS United States and the food we had we had metal trays coming back before we had uh, play settings, chinaware and silver uh -huh. standing out both ways, you know, and napkins and the whole bit. So the the so food on the Columbia was very nice. Yeah. So all nine of you were on the Columbia then. That's right. Mm -hmm. And did you uh, you all stuck the air through the whole time? Well, yeah. We uh, when we got to uh, Liverpool. Oh no, no, we didn't go to Liverpool. We went to uh, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Glasgow it was, and uh, we got on a train and came on down to. Uh, Oh, what was the name of that uh, crew? And uh, we, uh, C R E W E, I think it was. And there was kind of a, um, a staging place. And from there, we went to uh, Shrewsbury. And while at Shrewsbury, we got a chance to fly uh, eight or ten hours of uh, P 47. And we got some other, we got some shots and some other things that. Uh, we spent uh, three or four weeks there, and then, uh, and they sent us down to um, Portland, I think it was, down on the southeast coast, <clears throat> and we were there just a short while, and then they put us on this uh, ship that went across over to Omaha Beach. Did you get to see part of England before you headed over? I'm sorry? Did you get to see any of England before you... Uh, <laughs> not much. We... Uh, didn't go on down and no, we went down to um, Wales and had a had some aerial gunnery or some uh, ground gunnery down there in the ocean, but uh, we didn't get out of Shrewsbury very much. When you got to Omaha Beach, was how long after the invasion was that? Hundred D plus one hundred and twenty. D plus one hundred and twenty. So how far had the, the Americans advanced by that? <clears throat> we were up around the Maginot Line. Really? And uh, so you arrived on the beachhead, and we yeah we uh, came in on on small boats, and uh, I guess it was LSTs or something like that. And uh, no, we we came in on a on a larger ship. I don't uh, know what it was, but it dropped it dropped its uh, mm -hmm. front, and we were able to walk off without getting wet. And they walked us up the hill. Well, we got we got our had our luggage, and we were about to go up the hill. And they had it stopped there, and, and uh, we saw a, a truck 
coming down GI truck and uh, with a canvas canopy on it. And there were three or four Germans in there in the back with POW on it, on their arms. And uh, so they picked up our luggage and put it in the truck and then climbed in the truck and they took off and went up the hill. And we had to walk up the hill. <laughs> so <laughs> we say, big deal. The Germans that we captured, they get to ride, we have to walk. <laughs> so we griped about it. That was probably the closest. <clears throat> Is that when you really seen Omaha Beach? Was there a lot of battle damage there? And well, we couldn't tell there was battle damage. There were rocks and sand and but so But you forth. really knew that you were in the war? Well, we knew we were, we were, we were in the combat, uh, close to a combat zone. So it did, uh, you must have been within days of going into combat at that point? Well, a little, a few days. It was two or three weeks maybe. Uh -huh. We had one experience. We went up there, we walked up about four miles and they had this tent city that they had, that we were to stay in. It was damp and the, the, the canvas sagged and so forth. They had some stoves in there and they said, over there is some wood, uh, you can make yourself a fire. And the wood was wet and we didn't have any paper. It was kind of, we kind of got disgusted with that. So uh, dare to, we stayed there about a week and I don't know why we stayed that long, but we did. But anyway, uh, this one fellow, two of us rather, uh, uh, rather there were three of us, two other fellows and myself, went out walking one day. We had nothing to do, so we went walking and we came by a, uh, a motor pool. And there was a bunch of brand new Jeeps and weapons carriers and other vehicles in there. So this one fellow, Joe, from Texas, he was a little bolder than the rest of us. He, we crawled through the fence and we walked around and we noticed there was a bunch of uh, Jeeps that were being make, made up in a convoy to, to go out. So Joe says, let's take one of these Jeeps and get on the end of this convoy. So we found a Jeep with some money, with some gasoline in and uh, so when these other Jeeps went out, we tag, Joe was driving and we tagged on behind him. And of course the, the guard at the gate, uh, the officer handed his uh, papers to him and they saluted and they started out. And of course when we pulled up to the rear, well, we saluted him and went on out too. And he uh, didn't count that the, they had orders for 30 Jeeps and didn't count that there was actually 31 or whatever so the number was. The Jeep then. We had the Jeep, so then we thought, well, so we started kind of dragging back a little bit, and finally when we got to a point, we turned off and skedaddled. Then we realized, hey, we've got a hot Jeep here. We, they, you know, those numbers are painted on the, on the side, so on the hood. So we went back to our tent city, and we went to the motor pool and got some tools. And we had seen the, a Jeep had been down in a ditch, down about tw 20 feet into a, hole down there. It had been wrecked during the, during the invasion. So we knew that that Jeep, the numbers had already been wiped off. So we went down and took that hood off that Jeep down there and brought it up and put it on our Jeep and threw our hood back down. <laughs> so we had numbers that were already wiped out, you see. Uh. So we had ourselves a Jeep. <laughs> and then what were we going to do with it? So we, uh, we came back to camp and and our, we had an officer in charge of us there, but he didn't care. He was just, he was just one of us. He happened to be a, a captain or a major, but had been sent over for the first time. So mm -hmm. he was in charge, but he didn't care what we so did. So did you keep the Jeep all the way up to your air base? Or? No, we, uh, we moved up to Paris. Uh, and so uh, they told us that tomorrow morning we were going to go to Paris. And so to the 29th Repel Depot, whatever that is. So. We uh, drove our jeep up there, and we got uh, into town. Got down the, where the what they call a Com Z headquarters, mm -hmm. where General Eisenhower was, and all the other officers. We went in there. <clears throat> when we thought we'd go into the uh, the post office to find out where this 29th Repo Depot was. And <clears throat> they didn't know where it was. And, uh, we went around, and finally we said, well. We'd like to have a billet, so they, they gave us a billet for the night, and and we uh, we left the jeep parked there in their motor pool, and we took the took the uh, distributor out, and uh, or the rotor rather out uh. of the distributor. Told the GIs to watch our jeep, <laughs> so he said they'll be safe. 
So they took us in a weapons carrier out to a hotel, <clears throat> and we went to sleep. And the next morning, we were walking down the street to go to. We left our, ge our gear there, and we were going to take the subway and go back down and pick up our jeep. And we happened to run into one of the fellows at one of our blue flames. So he was out. <clears throat> he was out running that morning. He said, "Oh, he says we're only just a few blocks over here." So we. We knew where the 29th Repo Depot was, so we took our, we got the jeep and we came back and pulled into this motor pool they had there at this um, staging areas. <clears throat> and we checked in. We came back down to get into the jeep to go back and pick up our gear, and the sergeant came out, the uh, sergeant in the motor pool, and he says, "Are you the fellows that brought this jeep in?" And this one fellow, the Joe, he says, uh, why are you asking that, Sergeant? He says, well, when we first came to Paris, he says, we were assigned three Jeeps in consecutive number. And he says, there, he says, over there is, he says, one of them was stolen. The, the, like six, seven, six, six, seven, seven, six, seven, eight. And he says, there's six, 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 seven, seven, or six, seven, six, there's six, seven, eight. Now this is six, seven, seven right here. <laughs> so we uh, apparently the jeep was stolen in Paris and taken down to the coast and wrecked, and we picked up that hood and put it on our jeep and brought it back to the same place. Now that sounds like it's a, it, it sounds like it could never happen, <laughs> but <laughs> I saw those numbers and <laughs> they were in consecutive numbers. <laughs> <laughs> so you lost your jeep then. So we said, uh, well you don't. We said you don't know uh, who brought that jeep in, do you, Sergeant? He said never, never saw them. <laughs> he says, well, why don't you take us over? We were playing the Army game. He, he knew it, and we knew it. So why don't you take us over and get our gear? So he says, sure. He says, get in this weapons carrier. So we went over and got our gear and brought it back. We left the Jeep there. Mm -hmm. We couldn't have taken it any further anyway, so it was, it was all right. So then is that when he ended up getting sent up to? Then we were sent up to uh, Reims, France, and we, uh, we flew our first mission up there. So the, uh, when you went up, did you... Did they send you up with experienced pilots at first, or? Yeah, uh, we were assigned to a flight leader, and uh, this flight one of this this flight leader that I had, uh, he was a kind of a. I thought he was kind of an sob. Do <laughs> so you remember that flight pretty well? That first yeah, time? I remember it. His name was Sam Scalzi. He was from the, he was from the uh, East Coast, from Boston area, and uh, we went up. And uh, I could fly formation quite well. I, I liked formation, and I flew it very well. Uh, not bragging, but that's, it's a fact. So I could, I could tuck in there and stay. Had an excellent instructor on that. When we got down, we, we were being debriefed. He says, Finley, he says, what was your oil pressure 20 minutes out? And uh, I says, well, it was in the green line. You know, we have a red line, the green line, red line. He says, no, don't say in the green line. He says, say 52 or 55 or whatever it is. He says, I want you to know at all times. And, he, and when you stand on that dock in Liverpool and they call your name, Finley, and you can say here, to get on the boat to go home, you can say here, thanks to Sam Skelsey. <laughs> I thought, what a poop. <laughs> but I didn't say anything. Of course, he was a captain and I was a gold, star, gold <laughs> second lieutenant. So when you had that first flight, what, <coughs> what did it consist of? Did you? Well, my first flight, we flew to Aachen, and uh, I dropped bombs on uh, Aachen. I don't remember what, it, so did you what our target was. So you experienced flak or enemy Oh, fire? yeah. I got some 88 millimeter around there, but uh, there wasn't anything. No pursued aircraft or anything? No, it wasn't. Uh, so what did you think about the flak? Was it close or was it? It wasn't close that time. Just saw the burst out there. And, yeah, uh, it. Uh, I saw. Know. I got. Uh, I saw flak later on. Though, a lot, that, a lot. At that point, it wasn't too impressive anymore. Well, uh, yeah, you. I was. Uh, you knew it could. It could well, knock. Yeah. knock. But uh, as it turned out, nothing happened, and we landed. So, and what do you think about that when you're flying to Aka and then you have never flown in combat? Just, did you have qualms about it, or? Yes, I suppose I did. <clears throat> I, uh, I've always felt confident, and uh, I felt I could do the job, and I didn't know what was coming up, and naturally I wanted to, uh, 
primarily I didn't want to foul up somebody else, you know. Mm -hmm. That was probably my main concern. And uh, but we we had practiced dive bombing, and so that wasn't any big deal. And um, we were not pinpoint bombing. I don't remember now what we what we uh, went after, whether it was a railroad station or whatever it was. But I got in line, and we went down, and I dropped the bomb, came back up, no problem. But I looked at my uh, airspeed and I mean my uh, oil pressure and oil temperature at all, all time, and. Uh, when I got back, he never asked me <laughs> what my oil pressure was. <laughs> but, so then, the uh, uh, most all of the nine blue flames flew that day, did they? Or um, I really don't know. Uh, we we uh, we weren't in we weren't in the same mission because we were in different uh, in different flights. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but uh, so when was it that you? Uh, was there ever a time when you went on the flight your first time that you really were that things were sort of bad that you were concerned or I'm sorry what was the question when you uh, when when you're out in your flights was there ever, was there one flight early on in particular that you that you were concerned about that things were sort of going bad and oh yeah uh, <clears throat> well. We uh, see. I got shot down on my fifth mission, but um, if I may go back a little bit, about the second or third mission we went out, <clears throat> we came back and we couldn't uh, land at our field <clears throat> because the weather had socked in. So we uh, <clears throat> we landed at a place called Charleroi, and uh, like King Charles in French, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, we pulled into this base, and uh, they said, well. We just we just landed here ourselves. We just checked in ourselves, and he says we and they were living in tents. He says we don't have any any place for you, so he says we'll give you a, a truck and take you into town. See if we can't billet you in town. So we went into this town of Charleroi and uh, went to the police station. There was one fellow who was a one of the policemen had lived in Canada, French Canada, and uh, so he spoke English. So we told him what our problem. We had 36 pilots here, and, and uh, we need to overnight. So he talked to his other other policeman, and he says, "All right, half of you come with me, and half of you go with Pierre or whoever." And uh, so we went down the street, and he started knocking on doors. And he would jabber and say, two of you in here," and go down. Three of you in here, and uh, we came to a, a tavern, and. Uh, so there was two of us, and so we went into this tavern, and they had it upstairs. They had bedrooms upstairs, and uh, so we had a we had a tavern as our as our upkeep. So what was that like staying in the tavern? Well, it was noisy until until they closed, you know, and uh, they had uh, they had girls down there, and so it was wasn't too unpleasant. But uh, we were we didn't uh, get into any trouble that night. That, uh, the, the, were you building with one of your friends from? Yeah, one of the, well, not one of the Blue Flames. It was mm -hmm. a, another fellow. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he was from, happened to be from uh, New Iberia, Louisiana. So when you fl flew into this other, uh, I take it when the weather cleared and you flew back to your... The next morning we flew back, yeah. And then you went out patrol again that day? Yeah, or? well, not that day, but... Uh, <clears throat> on the on the fourth mission, or after after the fourth mission, <clears throat> we moved up to um, Belgium near a town called Louvain, or they now call it Leuven, L-E-U-V-E-N. It's uh, Flemish and Louvain, L-O-U-V-A-I-N is the French. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, so we were <clears throat> we were at that field, and we lived in a uh, in a chateau uh, about five miles, or maybe less than three miles off the base. <clears throat> it had been a uh, private chateau, and then it was taken over as a um, um, orphanage for a while. It, had, it was a big place. And then the Germans came and took it over, and then we came and took it over. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> and it was near a little village uh, called uh, Dongelberg. And the, uh, the Belgians called it Donjobert. Hmm. <clears throat> but uh, anyway, we, uh, I flew, uh, my first mission out of there would be my fifth mission. And uh, <clears throat> we were going to drop bombs over by the Rhine River someplace, I forget now. Oh, oh it was the, uh, it was a bridge crossing the uh, Roar, not the Roar, um, one of the tributaries that run into the Rhine. Mm -hmm. And I was carrying a thousand pound bomb that day. And we flew out and uh, as, I, as uh, we were flying, everything was all clear. We came up through the clouds. We had to, uh, had to form into four plane flights and then fly formation up through the clouds. And we got up. I was. A, we were about the last one off, so uh, we got we got up above the clouds. A beautiful day up there, <clears throat> and we were heading toward the our mission, our target rather, and uh, was flying along. And all of a sudden, wham! An 88 millimeter exploded under my left wing, and I started spinning down. And uh, I was not a religious person at that time, but I said, "Oh God, get me out of this." And I pulled the stick back, and I had the feeling that there was a pressure on the back of my hand pulling that stick. Mm -hmm. And I, I pulled out, and it was very unstable. So I called in, and I said, <clears throat> that was a miracle that I was able to pull it out. That was miracle number one. And uh, I called in and said, I'm hit and going home. And immediately my ground radar at the base said, steer 270 degrees, and I looked at my compass and I was going exactly 270. Hmm. It wasn't 265 or 275, it was just exactly 270. And my stick was, to fly straight and level, my stick was clear over on the right hand side of the cockpit. And uh, if I would uh, try to move it very much, the, um, the left wing tended to want to stall out and put me into another spin. So uh, <clears throat> the leader sent my, uh, sent one of the fellows back to escort me. And uh, he flew around my plane and told me that uh, I had a hole out there as big as a refrigerator. <clears throat> and I cut my aileron cable and my, my pitot tube, uh, which meant that I didn't have any airspeed. <clears throat> and I was, uh, I still had that thousand pound bomb on, so I, I jettisoned the bomb and almost simultaneously there were, uh, Germans threw up another salvo of four 88 millimeters, and they, the two bursts, two in front of me and two behind me, so I was perfectly bracketed with these 88 millimeters. And I learned later that the, that the 88s exploded in a cone upward and downward, so I was in that cone of protection, you might say. So that was the second miracle, <clears throat> or well, the first miracle, I guess, the fact that I came out of it. Second, that I was heading exactly toward home, and then that they, they missed me on that one. And uh, so I decided I would have to bail out because I couldn't go down through that many feet of clouds without any airspeed indicator. And with about a 300 foot ceiling and a crosswind that day, it was about 25 miles an hour crosswind. So my plane wasn't stable. So I uh, trimmed every, I trimmed it, it wanted to, it tended to want to roll to the right. So I trimmed it nose heavy so that, and it was planning to get out on the left side so that when I did, the plane would roll to the right and would, would go down and hopefully that tail would miss me because it was only back there about six or eight feet. It seemed like it looked pretty big back there. It looked as big as that, that cupboard mm -hmm. there, you know. <clears throat> and uh, so I, uh, I had my oxygen mask on, I unhooked that, and I unhooked my radio, and I stuck everything down inside my leather jacket and zipped it up real tight. And I had my helmet on, and I tightened that down, had my oxygen mask on. So I, uh, I, I trimmed it, as I say, nose heavy, <clears throat> and I got up on the seat, opened the cockpit, opened the canopy, and stuck my head out, and everything went whoosh, and it was all gone, mm -hmm. all of this stuff. So I was there and I, uh, it started to go down and I could hear it start winding up like my, like the old World War I movies that I saw and how it would get 
screaming, you know. So I finally, I was going to get back in and I decided, well, I better not. So I pushed off and uh, I made myself as small as possible. <clears throat> and uh, after I felt that I, I was away from the plane, my, I couldn't see, uh, my eyes were closed. So I pulled the ripcord and it seemed like forever. The, it finally uh, opened and I felt a kind of a jerk like that. And I tried to look up to see my chute and my, I couldn't get my head up. So, uh, you know, I had straps went across the legs and straps that went mm -hmm. over your shoulder and then there was a big buckle that went here, across here. Well, this buckle, when I landed, I, when I, I must have been in a sitting position when the chute opened because this buckle went up past my face and ended up behind my head. Uh -huh. it, missed, it could have hit me in the chin and knocked me out, you know, or take my face off or something. So I couldn't get it back over my head, so I had to unbuckle it back there and bring it back here and buckle it right. And I was a little bit shaky by that time. <laughs> so then I went down into the clouds. And uh, as I say, it was about a 500-foot ceiling and very windy that day. So when I came down, it was eerie to come down through the clouds. There was no sound whatsoever, no feeling of, of um, motion at all. And I thought... Uh, I'd heard uh, a term in, that the Catholics used as limbo, and I said I wondered why if limbo was like this. It was just there was just nothing, no no sound, no no feeling, no swaying or anything. I tried to look up and see my canopy, and it was uh, I couldn't see that. Uh, I could see shroud lines going up, but I couldn't see the just shoe like itself. Just hanging there, huh? Yeah, uh -huh. and uh, finally I came down through the clouds. <clears throat> I was about 800 feet off the ground, I guess. And I was going backwards, and I knew that wasn't the way to land because you could break your neck, you know. So we had had we'd never had any experience in in uh, parachuting, but they told us that if we wanted to turn our chute, take your right hand and reach up and grab your left shroud lines. Take your left hand, grab your right right shroud shroud lines, and then pull this way, and that would cause the the chute to turn like this, so that we would be going down facing so that we could tumble if we had to. So <clears throat> I finally got the, th after a while, I got the thing around and I was coming down and I tried to see where I was going and there was a, a stone fence about this high and about that wide and then there was a cobblestone road that was down about 10 feet below the level of the ground. And then there was a two-story brick or stone house over here and I was heading for all of that stuff. And when you got down, I could see 25, 35 miles an hour going across the ground. That's, that's going pretty fast. And I was also going down pretty fast. So I got down within 100 feet or so of the ground, and the wind caught my chute and spun me around backwards again. So I uh, did my shroud line bit, and I got about halfway around, and the chute fell forward, and, or blew forward, and I came swinging down like a pendulum. And I landed on my head and shoulder. Fortunately, it was November, and it was wet, and the field had been plowed. <clears throat> so I tried to grab the lower shroud lines and, and let the chute uh, fall flat, but I couldn't get enough pressure, uh, strength in it. So I just dug my elbows and my knees and my toes in the ground, and I plowed up about 100 yards of that fellow's field mm -hmm. and finally came to a stop. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, then I felt a little bit woozy. I felt like I might be passing out, so I put my head down on the cold ground and uh, had my eyes closed for a little bit. And then I heard talking, and I heard somebody say something about Alemán. And I knew that Alemán meant German, and, and uh, I thought, well, uh, I knew I was in Belgium. So I said, uh, I looked up, I said, no Alemán, American. And I pointed to my patch, and I showed him my dog tags and so forth. And uh, so I tried to get my, tried to get unbuckled on my chute, and I, I didn't have any strength in this arm. So I pointed to them, and they opened, they opened it up, and I told them to wrap it up. And they took me into this farmhouse, <coughs> and uh, it was in the kitchen, and, and uh, it was about three o'clock in the after, three or four o'clock in the afternoon by this time, and I hadn't had any lunch, <coughs> and I'd been cold, and. Uh, so she gave me a little shot of cognac, and I took that one. That was, that felt pretty good, you know. So she filled it up again, and I took it again. She wanted to do it again. I said, "No, merci," and uh, 
I didn't want to get <laughs> get drunk there, you know. And about that time, a young girl came in. She was about 15 years old, and she says uh, she could speak English. She says, "My name is Mimi, and my papa is the village doctor, and he's coming along shortly." So uh, uh, pretty soon he came, and <clears throat> and uh, I complained about my shoulder being hurt. And, uh, of course, I was carrying a 45 caliber pistol here, too, you see. So she very meekly, mildly said, would you please take off your gun? <laughs> so I took, the, took this 45 out, and I, I emptied the clip and made sure that it was, was uh, no, chamber, no, no uh, shell in the chamber. And I handed it to her. I said, I'll let you hold this, but I said, keep it in sight because I'm responsible for it. But when I pulled out that 45, all the people that were standing around, by that time there were 10 or 15 people in this little kitchen, you know, they, and they kind of, they started talking and kind of gave a sigh of relief. <laughs> they didn't know what, for sure whether I was a German or not. But, mm -hmm. but uh, anyway. Uh, there was big news in the village, though, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. So the doctor uh, she said, well, we'll take you into the hospital, Army Hospital. <clears throat> so we walked out the door. But this time my, my, I was holding my arm like this, and it was starting to get a little pain in here. And as I went out the front door, there were people standing on both sides, and they were, it was just like a football game, you know, where the, where the team comes out and everybody stands and cheers, and you run through a, a cordon of uh, people. And they were shaking my hands, and, and I was trying to hold it still so that it wouldn't, wouldn't hurt. Finally got to this car, and it was, it was the smallest car I ever saw in my life. I think it was a Citroen. <clears throat> it was a little black uh, Citroen. It wasn't, it wasn't very big at all. And, uh, but anyway, I got in the back seat with Mimi, the, this little girl, and her sister and her father was in the front seat. <clears throat> and on the way to the hospital, it was about 20, 25 miles, I think, I think we had uh, he had to get out three times and repair the tires. They blew. Uh, during the war, because he was a village doctor there, the Germans allowed him to, <clears throat> to keep his car. And I think they allotted him one liter of petrol a week, which uh, one liter is about a quart. But because he had, uh, he had people out in the countryside to take care of, they, they uh, let him have his car. And he rode his bicycle much of the time when the weather allowed. But if uh, some lady was having delivering at 3 o'clock in the morning, he'd usually take the car. But anyway, they got me to the Army Hospital there at uh, St. Tron. And I told, when they took me in, I told uh, them to uh, give him some gasoline. Well, I found out later on that they didn't. Because, uh, our, so what was wrong with your shoulder? Did you? I... Uh, I separated the collarbone oh. came up like that and so they had to uh, the doctor taped it down this way and taped my arm up this way and uh, I had to carry it like that for I was in the hospital for two weeks I think it was two or three weeks and uh, then when he finally took that off I couldn't get my elbow down I mean I, my, I couldn't get my arm down so down I had to soak in the tub several times and keep working it and finally got it down. So I mean, you felt that first jolt and you knew that an 88 had hit your wing. Did, what was your first thought? Oh, God, get me out of this. <laughs> that was my... That did you was think you were going to make it, did you, or did you think... Well, I, I was spinning down and I said, oh, God, get me out of this, and I, I pulled back on the stick and it came out. So after you hit the ground, you had those two cognacs and you were taking you to the, um, into the hospital, did it finally sort of hit you, the shock? And yeah, it, uh, I got to the hospital, and uh, I, I guess, I don't know what they did. Uh, I guess they, uh, that was when they taped it. And I went to bed, and I, I woke up. I was tired, you know, I mean, a shock. And I woke up, and I needed to go to the bathroom. So I asked the guy next door, where's the bathroom? He told me, uh, latrine. And I went down the hall and went in there, and I was standing at the urinal, and all of a sudden I started getting black. <clears throat> and it was, it was right on the corner, and I remember I leaned back against the wall, and my feet just slowly slid out from under me, and I hit my head on a, mm -hmm. some pipes. And uh, so I, uh, I tried to holler, and it was like in a dream. I couldn't get any 
couldn't get any volume. So uh, finally, they, uh, I was able to make make a noise, and the ward ward boy heard me and came in and picked me up and walked me back to my bed, and I was all right again. But uh, I think that was part of the concussion, probably. Uh, so laying there out. for three weeks, recovering, you probably had lots of time to replay the whole. Oh yeah, yeah. I, the first thing I wanted to do was to write letters to my wife and to my mother because I didn't want them to get a uh, telegram from the government where, you know, greetings <laughs> because my mother might have had a heart attack, you know, to get the get a War Department telegram. You know, those are pretty serious in those days. So I wrote right away and, and got letters out to them. And uh, So you heard from your, you were married by then, huh? Yeah. I got married in uh, Baton Rouge. Right. So you heard uh, your mom wrote pretty often, did she, and your wife? Yeah, mm -hmm. probably <clears throat> once a week or so. So then, after you got discharged from the hospital, did you go back? Well, to the I went back to the went back to the base, <clears throat> and um, so they were going to send me over to England for a rest leave, and I said, uh, uh, I didn't. I didn't have enough time for my flight pay. I'd like to get some flight pay. I get fifty percent, see, flight pay. So <clears throat> they worked up a, an order to put me on temporary duties, and uh, they had a an L five pilot there fly me around for four hours so I could get four hours of flight time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the doctor said it was to check out the, whether my whether my arm was uh, satisfactory for flight. Uh, for flying in combat, and of course, after the four hours, he decided that I wasn't wasn't eligible for flying, so I, he would send me over to England to a rest leave. <laughs> so, so I was able to get my uh, flight pay that way. You know, the, we took care of each other that way. <laughs> so then, then you end up um, going back to your unit then. And well, I was back in my unit at that time. But in, after the England and the rest period. Oh, well, yeah, well, I went went over to England, and then uh, we had a. One of the fellows had had uh, reached his uh, 200 hours, uh, and um, so he was, rather than to go home, they made him, uh, he didn't want to go home, so they made him a C-47. We got a C-47 someplace, a, you know, a transport plane. So he would transport people to go oh, down to the Riviera, or he'd go over to England for a booze run, whatever, and uh, <clears throat> so... Uh, he came over and got me from England and and, uh, and uh, came back to the base and we couldn't get we couldn't fly the, uh, we couldn't land that day because planes were landing and taking off and landing and taking off and we had to stooge around there for two or three hours and with with um, a report that there was enemy aircraft in the area and it was the first day of the Battle of the Bulge. Uh -huh. So uh, <clears throat> we landed, and that night the weather socked in, and we couldn't get off the ground for two or three weeks, and it was terrible. We wanted to, we wanted to get out there, and the, the, we could, we got word, you know, that the battle was going, and, and uh, but we couldn't, we couldn't do anything about it because the weather was just, even the birds were were walking. Huh. So did you get that C forty seven the same way that you got that Jeep, or did you, or did you actually? Someone no, I think I think it was it was given to the squadron oh, okay. as uh, transport. No, it was. So uh, during the whole battle of the Bulls, and you you weren't operational. Then, well, right? not not the whole battle. It, uh, as soon as the weather was able to clear that we could get off, we were over there like like bees, you know, and uh, it. Uh, what well, was the st state of the battle by the time that you got in the air? Had it, the tide turned by then, or? No, I don't think so. Um, we were we were socked in for oh two or three weeks, and uh, but when <clears throat> when we uh, when we were were able to get off the ground, we knocked out a lot of trucks and and uh, uh, tanks, and uh, I think the infantry appreciated having the so air a lot cover. of close air support. And, yeah. yeah. So were you just in a? Uh, we were. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Were you, you were just in the operational area then, and you would, you weren't striking targets, but uh, the ground forces would call for help, and then you. Yeah, we'd go out there. Uh, in fact, during that time, several of the fellows, not only in our group but in other groups, volunteered to go up and be ground control up there. <clears throat> we'd get with a, with a radio man because, the pilots could. Uh, 
could talk to pilots mm -hmm. in their own language, where maybe a um, a GI wouldn't understand, you know. Or, so we went up. And we were attached to a uh, uh, infantry outfit or to a tank outfit or something, and uh, we would. Uh, so you get right up in the front line, then on the ground. Yeah, yeah. Did you ever do that, or I? I didn't volunteer. I, I decided friends. that I would. I would go any place that they wanted me to, but I wasn't going to volunteer. <laughs> the uh, that and the uh, that was all pretty much ground support then, attacking tanks and the Germans and the towns and. Were I, the, I'm sorry, I didn't. Did the Germans have a lot of aircraft up? No, um, no, not a lot. <clears throat> we didn't. Uh, I don't recall that we saw much enemy aircraft. You remember when the first time you ran into a German pilot was? Well, the only dogfight that I got into, I was, I was, uh, was the first day that I came back from <clears throat> bailing out, first day of flying, and we went over to uh, an airfield at Bonn, and we got into a. Uh, my, I was flying the Colonel's wing that day, <clears throat> and so my responsibility was to protect him. And we got into a dogfight with some 109s, and we were we were pulling, we were making a circle to the left, and we were trying to. The colonel couldn't pull enough lead to to uh, get this 109, and a, I don't know a 51 or a 38 came up underneath us and shot this shot it shot him down in front of us. So uh -huh. we uh, we missed him. Then then the thing was over. It, those dogfights didn't last very long, you know. At least. Uh, that, so when the 109 popped up in the scene, and you got in a dogfight, you was pretty much automatic from what you'd been trained about dogfights. And yeah, it was. We just got into a circle, and uh, as I say, my responsibility was to fly the colonel's wing that day. And if another, uh, for example, if if a, another ME 109 came in from another direction, I could I'd call him and say, uh, "Break right," and then I would take the lead and he'd be my wingman, you see. Mm -hmm. You know, pilots always have to use their hands to talk. <laughs> Did the, um, uh, what was the worst thing, what was the most dangerous thing about flying, do you think? Was it dogfights or anti-aircraft? We didn't get into dogfights. Our, our mission <clears throat> wasn't escort. The, the escort pilots got a lot of air-to-air uh, -air, uh, combat, but our mission was, was ground Support. So you get a lot of ground fire. Left. We we got ground fire. We got 88s. So we got uh, smaller. Uh, Is that your 40s and? You said that your t two of your two of the nine that they went down and were captured. Were they? Uh yes. Did they? Was it ground fire that took them down? Or? I yeah yes it was yeah. Was it on any of your flights, or were they on a different flight then? Or? No, I I wasn't on the mission. That they were either one of them was shot down. Do you remember what when they you got word that your friends had? Yes, the the uh, first one was shot down on his either his first or second mission, the one we were still in Reims. <clears throat> and uh, then uh, the second one was shot down. Uh, oh, about the time of the a um, uh, little after the bulge, around the first of the year, <clears throat> he got uh, hit over. Um, Bonn, I think it was, one of those places along the Rhine River, and he had to bail out. So what did you hear about it when, they, when the report came back? Did you know that they had gotten to the ground safely? or No, he was just, we didn't know. Just knew they were gone? No, we didn't know until quite a bit later. So was it pretty upsetting? Well, you know, uh, yes, uh, it's... Uh, you You don't like to... Hear about it, and you're sorry, and and you, but you go on, and you you have your missions to to do. You know, it's. Uh, you ran into them later on, though, right? Oh yes, survived yeah. the war. Yeah, after the war, they came home. In fact, <coughs> uh, these blue flames that I was telling you about, the nine of us, uh, we all came back, mm -hmm. and uh, we've we've maintained our connection. We've written and we've seen each other and so forth. In the meantime, uh, several of the fellows have died. We were down last year. We had uh, we were down to six, mm. and now this year we're down to four. 
So how did you find out that you were still alive? When was the first time that they contacted you after they were released from prisoner of war camps? Uh, I don't I don't recall that. Oh. Um, they got home and and uh, so we. Uh, as I say, we've kept in touch, even after we came back. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of the fellows were from uh, L.A. area. One was from the San Diego area. I was from up here. One fellow was from uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And uh, one was from uh, Dinuba, California. Mm -hmm. So we were scattered all over. But we, we would correspond, or we'd try to see each other whenever we can. And we're, next month we're having a, our P-47 Pilots Association get-together down in San Diego, and the remaining four of us are going to be mm -hmm. there. Looking forward to it. Huh. Did the, um, when it, and all this was going on and being in combat and flying and bailing out, was there any great fear or was it, or was it someone you were highly trained for that you just, I would say that we were all conscious of the possibility of being killed, but uh, it's not going to happen to me. It's, uh, I, I think what it is, we were, it was normal confidence that we were trained to do the job and Lord willing, we'd, we'd get the job done. Uh, I don't think any of us really, uh, I, I don't say we never had fear, but we didn't stew about it. Mm -hmm. We didn't allow it to, to take, uh, fear, didn't allow fear to take over our, uh, our lives. Uh, we had one fellow who, uh, he went on a dive bomb run and he said he saw this 20 millimeter come up from the ground and it came right up, you could see it coming up and uh, it hit, it went through his prop arc and hit the corner of his uh, windshield, which is very thick. And, it, and there's a plastic canopy, you know, it comes up here and it broke chunks of the canopy out, cut him a little bit. But it missed that four bladed prop and came right through and, and burst in his windshield. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, when he came back, he was he shaky, was shaky. Uh -huh. and uh, in fact, we called him Shaky Lane. His name was Lane, mm. and uh, I don't think he I don't think he flew after that. Uh -huh. I think they sent him home. Of course, he had been there uh, before I came, so I don't know how many how many missions he had. But uh, he was the only one that I know of that seemed to want to ground himself. When you got um, when when the weather came down on you and, and you were stuck in base for three weeks. What did you do to break the monotony? I mean, well, we played uh, played cards. Played. I learned to play bridge when I was there. We played a little poker once in a while, but not. You didn't often. steal another jeep and go in town, or what's that? So you didn't steal another jeep and go in town? No, no, we didn't. <coughs> uh, there was a little uh, town near there. We called it Dongleberg, D O N G L E B E R G, Dongleberg, <coughs> and. Uh, it was, we lived in this chateau, <coughs> excuse me, we lived in this chateau and the, it was about uh, oh, a half mile away with this little town. Well, many, many years later, we used to go down there and they had a, uh, uh, a room, a little bit bigger than this room, and they had some kind of a hurdy-gurdy type of uh, uh, music machine. And instead of having rolls, like we have a roll player piano, it had it had books and it would fold out like this and go through this. It had holes in it like a like a player piano. And we'd stand back. We'd take turns. We'd stand back there and turn this big crank and we'd run these rolls through there. And the music would play, and the girls from around the village would come around and we would do would do the we'd do a dance. They uh, they kind of hopped around and we called it the Dongleberg Hop. <laughs> uh, I don't think they knew how to. How to waltz or anything like that. So anyway, we, we did this Dongleberg hop. And many years later, when I, uh, this 
Mimi, this little girl that uh, I was telling you about, we became close friends, and she visited us over here, and we visited her over there in later years. And uh, one day we went out on a drive, and we happened to come through this little town. Uh, and uh, I had asked her if she knew where Dongleberg was, and she said, no, I don't. So we were, I was driving down this road. I said, you know, I think we're coming to Dongleberg. I said, I think there's going to be a... A, a bridge up here over a quarry, and we're going to make a left turn, and a right turn will be in the town. And sure enough, that's the way it is. And I said, and there's the tavern. And when I saw the town sign, she says, oh, you mean Don Jobert. I called it Dongleberg. <laughs> For her, it was Don Jobert. <laughs> so we, we, and I said, and there's the tavern we used to go to. So we pulled in there, and uh, a man came there to... to uh, to wait on a young man, 30-ish 30, or so, and uh, sh so in her Flemish she asked him if uh, he was there during the war. He says, oh no, but Mama's here. So, uh, and sh so Mimi told her, uh, told him who I was and what it was, and so Mama came out and she was just so happy to see one of the boys that, that uh, came back. And uh, I guess that was about the only one mm -hmm. <coughs> of the group that did come back there. And she, through the interpreter, through Mimi, she told me that that uh, on New Year's Eve, the girls had planned a uh, party for us, and they had gathered up all of their fruit that they could get, and they, they took all of their sugar ration and made a bunch of pies and brought it down to the tavern, figuring that we would be coming down there. But nobody came. And uh, I told them that we had been warned that there was going to be German, that was the time of the Battle of Bulge, that German paratroopers were going to drop on our field, and we were in alert, we were, Mimi and my wife were born just a few days apart, so they became very close friends, and she visited over us here several, uh, several times, and we visited her over there, and uh, my wife about 10 years ago was dying of cancer, and uh, Mimi, uh, Mimi and my wife were born the same same year, the same month, just a few days apart. So every Sunday, Mimi would call from Belgium to see how dear Barbara was. And uh, so uh, finally, I had to tell her that Barbara had died. And uh, I didn't hear any more from her until later. Um, I got the word that on her birthday, the following September, uh, her sister took her down to Brussels or down to Louvain to buy her a birthday present. And on the way back, they were in an automobile accident, and Mimi was killed. So uh, Mimi and Barbara were born the same year and died. Mm. Same. Pretty hard, huh? Yeah. So when you got back home, did uh, I take your, your mother was still... So what? Your mother was fearfully... Oh, Maybe she was relieved of, of course, yes. I think all mothers were, and fathers. Oh, that was kind of a funny thing, too. I, uh, my wife and I were there, and one day my father motioned me. He says, come in here, son. Went into the bedroom. He says, he had kind of a smile on his face. He says, I don't know what this is, but he says, you've got a letter from Belgium, and it looks like some girl's handwriting. <laughs> And it was from Mimi. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, girlfriend. I, yeah, he thought that he, he knew, knew that you know how men are. You know? mm -hmm. So I explained to him that she was just uh, she was the interpreter for me. And so he said, "Well, I wasn't sure. I didn't want to cause any problem." You know? So did uh, what, what do you think was the hardest thing about your time in the service? Oh, I enjoyed it. I, I thought it was great. I, I was there anything that was just... Oh, I, you know, GIs gripe about the yeah. different things, but uh, I think the... Oh, I don't know. You just learn... I learned a lot of things, you know. I was a, that's a very uh, impressionable age anyway, and I enjoyed what I was doing, and I griped just like everybody else, but uh, all in all, I was I was... Pretty happy doing what I was doing. Is there anything that you think that um, history left out about the war and about that time? That history left out, you mean? And it's not in the history books. Well, 
You know, there were, there were how many million men in the service? There are a million stories that uh, haven't been told or mm -hmm. have been told. Uh, I don't know that there's anything of any consequence that uh, hasn't been. Uh, but each one it has an experience or a series of experiences that uh, it, it makes up the individual, you know, later on. It's part of our, <clears throat> it's like what we learn in school, and what we, or what we learn in the service, or what we learn in marriage, or, or what we learn in our, our business life, and it's all part of our makeup. So in that time of your life, you made friends for your life? And well, these, uh, these blue flames, as I say, we're, we're closer than brothers. And we're, Mimi. And we're uh, going to meet. I wrote, a, I wrote a letter to them last night. Uh, I think it would be nice if we could each chip in about 20 bucks or so and buy some flowers and send them to the wives of the... And the ones that aren't there anymore. Is, is that bond that you have with the Blue Flames, have you ever had a, a, um, a connection like that with a group of people <coughs> since? I have, a, <clears throat> I have a very good friend that we started uh, grade school together. And we've remained friends all of our life, and that, it's a real tight bond. But um, nothing like the Blue Flames. I just hear different veterans say that they'll, they'll see somebody, and whether it was, was their unit or another unit, if they see a patch or a hat, they don't even have to say anything. That, that, that there's some unique bond in there that... that uh, a lot of us will never ever experience. Yeah, that's right. Have you had anything you wanted to say to your the kids that haven't been born yet or grandchildren about your life and the <coughs> times and what you did? And well, <coughs> um, I I've enjoyed my life. I've been, Think there's a message in what you did as a young man during World War One or two, and what the country did for future generations that they should know. Well, I think I think that our our age group was uh, we came up through the depression, you know, and I think maybe that has uh, had a, had a bearing on us and. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm sure that the fellows that were in the Korean War and the, in the, uh, the Gulf and so forth had similar experiences, and, and uh, <clears throat> I'm sure that uh, they did the job well. I can't think of anything that, <clears throat> that we did that was so spectacular. You know, we did what, what needed to be done. And. Uh, I don't know what else to say. About that. no, that's quite a message just in itself, though. What do you think when you see uh, the American flag come by? What's that mean to you? Well, I, uh, I respect it. <clears throat> and I, uh, I hate to see these guys wearing it. As um, clothing, it means something. Does um, your time in uh, Europe fighting and the enemy, and you were telling me before we started this that um, you were in a writing class and is it your instructor that turned to the group and said that you're the only person who's ever killed anybody in the room? Yeah, that's... Uh, Does that... One night he says, you know, I think Bob here is the only one who's ever killed anybody. Did that surprise you? Yes, it did. It kind of shocked me. And, uh, I, I, yeah, that was uh, kind of caught me up short. 
So do you have to think about that? That well, I, uh, you know, when you're, you don't, you don't see, uh, you don't see the death that you, you cause normally, in the work that we were doing. Now, if you're, if you're in a, a dog fight and you shoot somebody down, you know that. But um, see, we didn't, we didn't really run into planes, uh, uh, dog fighting much in 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 the mission that we were doing. But. Um, one day, <clears throat> I was. Uh, it was at the crossing of the Rhine River. We just got a foothold across the Rhine, <clears throat> and uh, so our mission was to go out. We had three or four different possible targets to go to. We had a kind of a triangular run to make, and the order was that any moving stock going toward the front was fair game. It could be horse-drawn wagons. They used to. The, they brought uh, ammunition, you know, under hay hay wagons. Or any kind of movement of trucks or anything going toward the front was fair game. So I had my flight out this one day. There were four four of us, and uh, I noticed a truck going down the highway. <clears throat> and uh, so I called it in, and I peeled off and went down. And the truck uh, came up to a, a Y in the road and stopped right there at the Y. And it was a a beautiful target for me because I could just run my sight right up that road and when I get to a certain point I drop my bombs and I know the bombs are going to where they're going to go. So I dropped my bombs and I pulled off to one side and looked down and that whole intersection was just completely obliterated. Just a, I, I must have bracketed that truck. So I must have killed at least the driver. There might have been other things in there. I don't know whether it was ammunition or whether it was uh, Personnel or whatever it was, but I know I must have killed somebody that day, mm -hmm. if if for if no one else, you know. Mm -hmm. But that uh, that was my mission, and that was what I did. And uh, you enjoyed your it sounds like you enjoyed the people that you liberated. I did, yeah. It was uh, I I uh, you know uh, people say you mean you enjoyed killing? No, you enjoyed. I enjoyed. People. Getting the job done that needed to be done. And you made lots of friends along the way, it sounds like. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, especially these nine fellows are real close friends, you know. Will you ever go back to Europe one last time, you think? or? Oh, I've been over there several times. <coughs> You've been there um, since Mimi passed away? or? I haven't been there since Mimi passed away, no. Um, No, I. Uh, so I in the I was in the travel business, you see. So I I got a chance to travel all over the world. I've been to oh about a hundred countries and mm -hmm. island groups. Have you ever talked to any anyone on the other side that matter of fact, taking I did. a shot at you? <laughs> I was uh, I was on a trip to Guam. Uh, I think it was Guam, and we had a, a German. Uh, any aircraft. Uh, he was a travel agent, and uh, he. Uh, there was this one other fellow there. What did he do? But anyway, uh, I think he was in the infantry, American infantry. And I was in the Air Corps. This German was in the tank, so we went out one evening and had a party together, the three of us. It was, it was great. So. Uh, <clears throat> Well, it's very nice to meet you. Well, nice Mr. to meet Finley. you, too. I hope that uh, you got all you need. Oh, to... Very interesting. And I enjoy okay. talking to you.